You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is an episode about investing. Since I think that investing is a really important aspect of working your way towards financial freedom and having as much opportunity to do what you want with your life, um, I wanted to talk about one of the more technical aspects of investing that I've found extremely helpful. So if you're interested in saving money and working towards having more financial freedom in the future, then I think the, the technical side of investing is very important to know about. But there's a lot of contradictory views about it. Um, so I'm going to talk about something that I've found really useful, and that's diversification in investing. How diversification can help you uh, reduce the risk of losing money uh, and increase your returns by what's called volatility harvesting. So that's what this episode is about. So before talking about diversification, I think it'd be useful to look at some of the other approaches to investing that don't use diversification. One approach that um, many people adopt is to buy and hold for the long term. And typically, this will be used by people who have a a favorite asset class. So it might be stocks, for example. And there are many people who take the view that stocks, uh, because they represent productive companies, are the real true source of of, uh, wealth generation and that the best kind of investing is just to buy stocks and hold them for the long term regardless of the ups and downs because they will go up in the end. So people who take this approach simply buy and hold. And you can see the same approach for people who have a different favorite asset class. So, for example, there are people who really like precious metals, and they take the view that given the way that uh, governments manipulate the money supply and the problems that we have with debt in Western economies, that precious metals, in particular gold, is really the key thing to put your wealth in and just hold it for the long term, because whatever's going to happen in terms of volatile ups and downs and swings in the short term ultimately precious metals have to get more valuable so you know five years down the line it'll be really worth holding them now and uh, that's the same type of buy and hold approach and you can apply this type of approach to any uh, particular favorite type of asset that you have you know if you think bitcoin is great and you think it's the way of the future and uh, it's going to be a new Uh, money and international money uh, there are people who choose to put all of their money into bitcoin and again the bitcoin is very volatile uh, but their view is well i'm just putting money in and i'm going to hold because long term whether it's volatile up and down now long term bitcoin is going to get more and more valuable so that's why buy and hold works for me and these approaches are all based on rationale that you know makes a lot of sense Uh, stocks are the ultimate source of wealth in terms of generating new value. It's true. So I can understand people who want to hold stocks. Gold is a store of value that protects against inflation, and we do have problems with debt, so I can understand people who want to hold gold. And even new things like Bitcoin, there's a, there is a, a real potential there. So in many ways, it makes a lot of sense. The problem with any of these approaches, though, is that if you put all of your eggs in one basket by investing all of your money into one particular asset class, then you are at risk of having a huge decline in your overall net worth overnight because of volatility. And this happened in 2008 for people who were very heavily into stocks when the stock market crashed. And it just happened in the last week for people who were very heavily into gold when the gold price crashed. And that volatility uh, really hurts you because even if you do want ultimately to hold more stocks or more gold, the volatility means that you miss an opportunity to buy cheap when there is a crash. And you also have to deal with the emotional cost of seeing 
huge declines in a very short period of time in your portfolio, which is psychologically really tough. So that's the buy and hold approach. Another approach is the approach of market timing. And the idea behind this approach is to say, what I will do is I'll identify an undervalued asset and I'll hold it for a while while it increases in value, ride it up the value curve, and then I'll sell it when it's overvalued and then move all my money into another undervalued asset and ride that one up and switch to the next best thing. The problem with this approach is that it is all based on guesswork and there is no science of, of which assets are going to go up next. Um, and people talk about data that they can use to make decisions about switching their money from one investment to another and investment advisors will show you patterns in graphs and talk about head and shoulders patterns and they'll talk about moving averages and they'll talk about resistance points and but the problem is that these things are all just pure guesswork there is no science underneath them and what I mean by that is that they do not provide robust predictions of what is going to happen in the future if they did then everybody who was putting their money into active investment funds would be making more money than people who, who are passive investors, and they're not, they make less. It's also a way that um, investment advisors basically fleece um, their clients because they encourage a lot of trading, and trading has transaction costs, and it also involves giving fees to investment advisors. So this game of trying to find the next big thing and jump in and then ride it up and sell it is all really just based on guesswork. And it ultimately... It tends to do the opposite of buying things cheaply and selling things when they're expensive. Because what happens is in, in identifying a trend, um, investment advisors tend to point to assets that are going up in value, which means that they're already relatively getting more expensive. And so a lot of the time, the people who are switching their money around into trying to find the next big thing end up being the people who buy in towards the top of a rise in value and really lose out badly. But it is an approach that some people attempt to do and, that, and that's called market timing. So that brings us on to diversification. The strategy of diversification has two aspects to it. One is diversification itself and the other is rebalancing. So we're going to run through how diversification works and how rebalancing works and then how they together give you not just less risk, but also more return in your investments. So first of all, how do you diversify your investments? Well, the key thing here is to choose different asset classes. Some people think of diversification as choosing different individual securities. And that an example of that would be to have stocks in one company and then stocks in another company in a different industry or something like that. But the problem is that both those investments are stocks and they're both going to be subject to the overall movement of the stock market, or at least there's a high probability that they will be. And consequently, they don't give you as much diversification as if you have some stocks, but something very, very different, like, for example, precious metals or gold. In the same way, if you own gold and you own silver, you are diversified into two different types of precious metal, but they're not giving you an asset class diversification because gold and silver are both precious metals. So for example, in the last week, if you held both gold and silver, then you wouldn't be protected against the decline in either of them because they both crashed at the same time because they're both precious metals and they're both very highly uh, related. I mean, they're very similar things to hold. So that's why you want to have very different asset classes uh, to give you diversification. And examples of different types of assets, um, which I've talked about before in the permanent portfolio approach, are things like stocks, gold, long-term bonds, cash. These are all very different kinds of things to hold. And there's a lot more detail that, that, could be going, that, that we could go into, but that's the basic idea, is holding different asset classes. So in the permanent portfolio approach, which I've talked about in previous podcasts, you hold 25% each of stocks, 
long-term bonds, gold, and cash. So that's diversification. But the key thing that goes together with diversification is rebalancing. And basically all that means is that when one of your asset types gets very highly valued, you harvest the profit. Uh, you sell off some of that asset and rebalance the money into the other assets that you hold. So if you're holding four different asset classes as you do in the permanent portfolio, like let's say you have 25% stocks and 25% uh, gold, 25% long-term bonds, 25% cash, then if one of them rises in value, uh, you sell it off and you buy more of the others. And that's a way of basically harvesting your profits. In order to do that, you have to decide on what's called rebalancing bands. And that means that you have to decide what percentage of your portfolio does a specific investment have to get to before you sell it. So, for example, if you hold 25% stocks, you've got to decide how big that stock element in your portfolio needs to get before, you, before it's time to uh, take some profit from it. So in the case of, of the approach that I follow, the permanent portfolio, the rebalancing bands typically are at 35% or 15%. So, for example, if you hold 25% stocks, then you just let it bump up and down over time. But if it gets to more than 35% of your overall portfolio, then you sell it off and you rebalance everything back to 25% each. And the same goes for any of the other assets that you hold. And that really is the way that you can automatically sell expensive and buy cheap because you're always going to be selling that part of your portfolio that at that particular moment in the market is really highly valued. It's a beautiful approach because it means that you don't have to do all the guesswork about trying to plot market averages and work out you know, resistance points and imagine that there are patterns and graphs. You can just simply use an automatic rebalancing approach where you decide, well, I'm very heavy on gold now, so I'm going to sell off as soon as it hits that 35% of my portfolio back down to 25% each. And I mean, to give you some examples of the way that this works, it, it forces you to uh, make good judgments against your, your own judgment, if you like. Um, I'll give you an example with the permanent portfolio. In 2008, uh, there was a huge stock market crash and uh, the value of my stocks uh, tumbled very dramatically. And just after the crash, I had to rebalance my portfolio and I had to buy a lot of stocks. And that really hurt because I just lost a lot of money on stocks and I didn't want to be throwing good money after bad, so to speak. Um, and it looked to me at the time and to a lot of people like maybe the stock market was going to go even further down. But actually, by buying the stocks when they were really cheap and rebalancing, I then got to ride up the rebound of stock value. And that helped to recover the loss that I had originally suffered in stocks in my portfolio. Another example um, was in 2011. In the summer of 2011, gold uh, increased very rapidly in value. And I hit a rebalancing band and had to sell some gold. And that was a very, very uh, difficult thing to do because I really believed that gold would continue to rise in value. And so it seemed to me like I was just missing out on an opportunity. But as it happened, I ended up selling right at the peak in, in gold. And I have to say, you know, these decisions which have been guided by more of a strategic approach um, without me trying to judge and time the market have been far more successful than any of my small attempts to time the market by buying things when I thought they were going to rise in value. So I really recommend uh, this approach because I, I think it really works. I use it. I use the diversification that um, Harry Brown recommends um, in his book, Fail Safe Investing, which is the permanent portfolio. And as I said, that's um, a combination of four different asset classes, stocks, bonds, gold, and cash uh, in equal 25% amounts. But you can really design any portfolio you want um, using this approach, um, as long as you bear in mind the principles that you want very different types of asset classes, and you want to set a percentage of each to hold, and then a rebalancing band 
that informs when you buy and sell, then you can you can do this with any asset classes you like. And if you do it with volatile asset classes, then you have the potential to harvest that volatility. Obviously, with all things to do with investing, this is just my opinion, you'll need to do your own research and decide for yourself what the best approach for you is. I'm just providing this to give you food for thought, but ultimately it's your decision and your responsibility what you do with your investments. But I do really recommend that you read more about diversification and rebalancing, because in my, in my opinion, uh, that's the best way to both reduce your risk and increase your return. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.